About a week ago, I sat down back there to answer your questions about the Inside Java newscast to celebrate its 100th episode. But I didn't get around to putting all my answers into the actual video because I ran out of time during editing because I had to rush to Jfall, which as always was a blast, by the way. If you get the chance to get there, do take it. So this is the second half of that video with all the remaining answers. And to catch you up a bit, the most recent one was about where the team sits in the world. And I created this funny little map, which shows that we're mostly in USA and Europe. But the second half of that question I didn't actually answer while sitting there, which is with that in mind, how do we work together? And I think the answer has uh, three parts. Uh, the first part, and I think a pretty big one is that we work pretty independently of one another. I would say that for most people on the team, most of their work is spent doing their own stuff. Meaning I create my newscast and Jose works on Jeb Cafes and then we travel to conferences, create our own talks or make our own explorations into new APIs. All of that is classic, sit at home, be focused on your own kind of work. Then if we have to communicate beyond that, maybe just because you know some tasks like organizing a live stream or Java 1 obviously or certain other things do require a lot of communication, but also you know, we reach out to each other when we, have help, when we need help or when we have the feeling that maybe somebody else already explored this and can uh, support our own explorations. I think the next step then definitely is Slack. Slack is the backbone of our communication. We do have email, obviously, but within the team, at least, we use it sparingly. Um, so if I reach out to Billy to say, hey, can you take over my newscast? This would be a Slack message, not an email, obviously. And so, yeah, Slack buries the big chunk of our communication in the last and third piece is just Zoom. So whenever something needs more high fidelity, we have meetings like the occasional team meeting. I really, I'm really proud of our team that we do not have like constant meetings. Um, I have very few throughout the week that I have to attend. Actually, just the one. I just have the one team meeting that I have to be at. And then the other meetings are, you know, ad hoc. Like if I need somebody and I need to communicate something that, is, you know, goes beyond what you can reasonably put in Slack, then it's going to be Zoom. But yeah, so work independently, chat wherever it's necessary, and then video calls uh, for the last, I don't know, 10, 20% maybe. Okay, with that, let's go back to me sitting there, being in the process of answering the second half of yet another question that I didn't yet complete. As you've just seen, the team is very wide. We do a bunch of different things. On this YouTube channel, not everybody is represented equally because other people do other important stuff that is aimed at, you know, another audience. And so, yes, we do a bunch of things, right? Back to the question, what we do to engage the community. Um, we attend and sponsor conferences um, and communities. Uh, I had to make a list because it's so many things. Uh, we run our own conference, Java 1. Definitely come there if you want to meet the architects. We're going to be in the Bay Area in mid-March, 17th to 19th, if I'm not correctly, 2026. Um, so that's something that we do that engages the community, I hope. YouTube, podcast, social media, of course. I do have my own Discord. Nipafx.dev is my website, and there's a Discord link at the top if you want to go there. Uh, we engage with the educational sector in the United States to make sure that Java stays the number one um, um, language in schools. But what we do not do, and that maybe that was what the question was aimed to, is something like coding challenges. And you know, maybe we should. Let me know in the comments. If you, if you, if you uh, folks think that, yeah, you know, like a coding challenge, something that we come up with would be interesting, maybe we will. Let us know. Does your background lean more to being a developer or doing media? That hurts. That really hurts. But I have to say, I get it, unfortunately. So I used to be a developer. I studied computer science. I got a job as a developer in 2011. I went head in with like 40 hour work weeks plus 10 hours of learning plus 10 hours of coding at home because it was so much fun. I went all in for like a couple of years. 2014, I started with a, did I start 2014 with a blog? Or 2015, I started with a blog. And then 2016, I started to speak at conferences. And since then, coding has become less. The rest of the question was, what kind of programming do you typically do on a weekly basis, if any? <laughs> on a weekly basis, pretty much nothing. Uh, what I do do is create all kinds of examples and demos for my presentations and for, my, uh, for the videos, right? Whenever you see a code snippet, um, then that has a very, very high chance to have been executed earlier that day. Sometimes I make like tiny little edits and then, you know, I forget to run it again and then maybe sometimes there's a compiler error in these examples. But usually there shouldn't be because I run all of those. But um, beyond that, there are some internal software projects that I work a little bit on. One of them has been something I was really eager to get started and something I was like, I really want to do that. And then um, we found a reason to do this within the team in our work. And I had a bunch of time to do it. 
but it's not yet at a state where I want to publish it, so it's still unpublished. But that's the thing that I did, but also that comes more like in, in fits. <laughs> like I had like a couple of weeks, so I did a bunch of that, and since then, no. So that is also a solo project, so I've not been involved in large-scale development. <laughs> Like 2016 or 2017 or something. Because, you know, you can't do full-time coding and then do all of this stuff as well. Will we see you again at JFocus 2026? That's a very specific question. Unfortunately, no. Um, Anna is going to be there. Jose is going to be there. Not sure whether that's just going to be. Lise maybe also is going to be there. I'm not sure. So a bunch of us are already there. Uh, I set it up this year. I'm going to see you again. Oh, I see, set it up next year. I'm going to see you again the year after, I hope. Will you, resume post, will you resume posting on X, formerly Twitter? First of all, it's just Twitter. Screw X. Uh, but no, not as long as uh, uh, it's under Musk's leadership, or maybe more importantly, if it's, if it's employed in its current purpose, then no. How do you view the rise of AI content creation tools? Do you think it might have an impact on you reaching your desired audience? Could be good or bad. I'm not biased here. Okay, so how much time do you have? <laughs> I, I have thoughts on AI. I have way more thoughts and opinions on AI than I have actual knowledge about the subject, which, you know, so take everything with a grain of salt. That said, yeah, where do I start? Capabilities of any kind of innovation usually increases on kind of an S-curve. Initially, when the thing is unknown, it takes a long time to get it going and to build something that is workable. And then, once you are got it there, and all the pieces come together, you often see an exponential increase, where just the capabilities of this thing, whatever it is, goes through the roof. Then there's a very steep part in the middle, but sooner or later, usually, things top out. And then, they asymptotically go against a stable situation, right? Like, let's say smartphones, for example. Phones were, Mobile phones were evolving in small pieces for a long time, but then at some point all the pieces came together and you could build something like a smartphone. And then smartphones in the first years were like, saw so much improvement, right? And then now it's very stagnating because like now it's just like just very hard. You just need to do a lot of very hard work to even make an improvement in these tiny cameras, in these, um, in these chipsets, whatever. Okay, so anyway, so, so now the question about AI is, where on that curve are we? So last year I was like, I don't know where on that curve we are. We could be wherever. We could be at the bottom, we could be at the top. I do not know. Now with ChatGPT 5 and more people recognizing the, the limitations that might not be able to, to get removed. Recently the news were um, hallucinations might something that is just not eradicable, that might just always be there. It's intrinsic. On more complex tasks, LLM still fall over and it's very unclear whether they will ever succeed in that. So, oh right, the thing is that it seems to be pretty easy to poison them in a sense that you do not need a large amount of bad data for a model to start misbehaving and be misaligned. So maybe we're for close at the top now. We're not actually at the bottom of this S-curve. Maybe we're already at the top. I do not know. But the problem is, my answer, what AI does to my job, hinges dramatically on where on that curve we are. Let's say this right now is what LMs will this is the best LLMs will be for the next decade. They're just not going to get better. I mean, that's unlikely, right? That's extremely unlikely. But let's pick that one. I'm not worried. Um, at that point, LLMs will mostly just make programming and a lot of other tasks too more productive. But that's it. Like, it will not replace any variable. It will not replace um, me in my current role, at least. Okay, but if things do get better, then what? And here it becomes really interesting. Because the short-term worry of everybody is that you get replaced by your boss, right? You, you know, by a button. Your boss replaces you with a button. It presses the button, presses the AI button. Out comes whatever you do or whatever I do. And I think my job is way more vulnerable to this than all of your jobs. Because my job is take publicly available information, synthesize them, and make them amenable to a wider audience. AI is... Pretty good LMs are pretty good at that. So that's not great for me. So I think I'm more at risk than, than, um, than you probably are. But I do not think that that's the biggest risk. If it is easy to replace me with AI, then I'm not worried that my boss will replace me with AI. Then I'm worried that you will replace me with AI. Because you, you will be the ones 
who want to have the information that I'm sharing now, right? You're the ones, my, my prime example that I always give for like two years now I talk to people about this, my example is always the same. You get up in the morning, you prepare breakfast for your family before they get up and you're like, ask your favorite AI um, a tool to be like, hey, summarize the latest changes in Java for me. That thing will know that you have eight minutes until you're done buttering the toasts. That thing will know what it told you yesterday, it will know your interests and it will know your knowledge that you already have and it will purpose build the answer for that. You know, it could even be, I don't know, a sexy cowboy or whatever you want it to be, right? So in that situation, if AI gets good enough that you can, that, that, that my boss can replace me with a button, you can replace me with a button and you have a much higher incentive for that because if you replace me with a button, you get tailored information just to your situation that you're in, to your to knowledge that you have, to the time that you have available, in the mode that you have available. Can you just listen or can you actually watch? If you watch, code examples make sense, right? If you can't, it has to be audio only. So all of those things, um, are, I don't know which of those futures will, uh, will come to be, but yeah, if that future comes to be, then you guys are gonna replace me and then, I don't know, I think most, at that point, if AI is that capable, that if AI is that capable that you will replace me with a press of a button, or my videos, I would say. Then you would also replace many blog posts. Everything where I synthesize information is at that point, with that quality level, super replaceable. So what remains is in-person conferences, maybe? What we are having here is called a parasocial relationship. If those go away because the audience increasingly replaces the people they watch or the people they listen to or the people whose articles they read by AI, then even the parasocial relationships that we have, which for a whole lot of us are already, already a big chunk of all our social relationships, if they also go away, then maybe there's an in increased interest in in-person events, in uh, Java user group meetings, in conferences. So I think that that is there's a decent chance for that. And also networking remains ever important. So that also is something you can only do at conferences. So I'm thinking if AI replaces most of my work with you, you, you pressing a button, then what will probably remain is going to conferences. So in that scenario, I'm looking at a future where I'm like traveling 24 seven, which I don't know. Traveling for work used to be great fun. Now it is still fun but it's considerably less so than it used to be. And if I have to do it 24 seven, I think the fun will leave it very, very soon. So yeah, please don't replace me with an I button, folks. Please, I'm doing my best here. Please, please, please like and subscribe the video. Please. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh no, I was not kidding. Do like and subscribe the video. Um, do it, like the video and subscribe the channel and leave a comment and all of that and I'll see you again in two weeks for episode 101. So long.